He looks like a nice guy. That's what's coming up on the Art of Bombing, episode 151. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast, and nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing, so Dan went out and bought a tape deck, who knows why he bought a tape deck, now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s, so hey there all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work, tell him all about your worst times, it's The Art of Bombing. Welcome back to a brand new episode of The Art of Bombing. It is Tuesday, July 28th. I'm Dan Bublis Jr. here with you as always. I hope everybody's week is off to a good start. I hope you enjoyed Friday's episode of The Art of Bombing, uh, episode 150. Can you believe that? That means this is 151. We're cooking right along releasing these episodes. However, we are going to slow down. This is a good time for me to remind everybody that this will be the last week that there will be two episodes. So I have two episodes this week, and then starting next week, the first week of August, we will be back to one episode a week, and that will be on Tuesday. So... I have to uh, slow down a little bit because school's going to be starting back up and I got to concentrate and focus on that. And I got some other things I want to do, so I'm going to slow back down. Like I said, when I decided to do two episodes, I said it was probably going to be temporary while I had so many episodes in the bank. And guess what? Now I don't have so many episodes in the bank. So here we are. Uh, today on the show, I'm joined by a very funny comedian and hardcore podcaster, Chris Duke. That boy, he's putting out three podcasts a week. Three different podcasts a week. He's got a, a, a one that comes out Wednesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. He's got something different that comes out. So, uh, But that's what's coming up on the show. Uh, aside from, you know, I don't know. I don't know, maybe I should start doing more previews of what the conversation is going to be about in the intro. I don't know. I'm going to leave that up to you guys. If you think that... We should, that I, not we, I guess, that I should do a little preview and talk a little bit about what the conversation is going to be about in this intro. Let me know. Why don't you send an email to theartofbombingpod at gmail.com and tell me what your thoughts are. Or you can leave a comment at the uh, on the Facebook page, the Facebook group, or the website, artofbombingpod.com. You can go there and leave a leave a comment in the comment box, and uh, maybe we'll change it up, and I'll start uh, I'll start uh, giving a little preview of what's to come, because I'm excited about this episode. I'm excited about every episode that I do. So, all right, I don't have a whole lot to promote. I do have uh, uh, August fourteenth. Uh, th- August fourteenth, I will be in Garrison, South Dakota, for a live show. Then I have another live show coming up and some virtual stuff coming up at the end of August. But uh, I don't want to get too into that because we're not quite there yet. So I do have one correction before I get into this conversation. Uh, Chris and I were talking about different things and we started talking about music. And I was talking about going to a Warp Tour. And I couldn't remember the band. Uh, the bands. There's two bands that signed my joke book. The one was Real Big Fish. I couldn't remember the other one. I was having a, a senior moment, if you will. And I just want to say that uh, I remembered who it was uh, after I went and looked. I had to look. I was like, I can't believe I forgot the other band. And in in the interview or in the conversation, I said uh, I thought it was Operation Ivy. I was a dummy. I don't know why I said that. I knew it wasn't. Uh, Operation Ivy. It was Less Than Jake. Less Than Jake is the band that signed my joke book. So Real Big Fish and Less Than Jake are the two bands that have signed my joke book. And uh, I just wanted to make that correction. So there you have a little you have a little preview of what's to come. All right, that's enough of my babbling. Remember, subscribe to the podcast. Share the podcast with a friend. Share it on social media. Subscribe. Give it a five star rating and review it. Give it some you know some words. Say some nice words about the podcast. That really helps. And uh, for all of you that keep listening for every episode, every 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 week here in. The, through and through, I want to say thank you. And let's get into this conversation with Chris. Enjoy. All right. And from the top. Uh, no. <laughs> Do the whole radio. And now we're at the top of the hour. We're here with Chris Duke. Uh, <laughs> 
anyway, so I see you're keeping pretty busy now. You got like all kinds of podcast stuff going on. Yeah, we're we've got three different uh, shows going on right now. Wow. So so you got you got the uh, the the new one, which is dude, absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. How many? So are you doing them all like weekly or? It seems like it seems like every day you're putting something out. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, so every Tuesday is Dude Absolutely, and then every Wednesday is the Not So Anonymous Alcoholic, and then we're getting more in the can for the original show Duck Duck Gray Duke. Oh, okay. Um, and so then with that, hopefully we'll release those every Thursday. Oh, okay. So you'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. Essentially. Wow. That's a lot. And a different <laughs> one. Do you release them all in the same feed then? Yeah. Yep. So they're all on the Duck Duck Radio. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you search that, then you'll find all of the episodes. Yeah. Is there a reason you chose to do it that way as opposed to doing like uh, having splitting each one have splitting them up? Other, I mean, aside from obviously that costs more money. Yeah, I was say, money, <laughs> that's money was an obvious first thing. And then I thought, kind of like how um, your mom's house podcast, they've got three different shows on their network as well. So they like uh, with uh, Dr. Drew, uh, the Honeydew, and then their normal thing. And I thought, mm-hmm. you know, if if they're already subscribed to Duck Duck Grey Duke, then. It's just extra episodes for who, whoever's already involved. No, oh, yeah, for sure. No, I'm playing. For sure. Yeah. So oh. what's this show called? The Art of Booming? Yeah, that's right. The so, Art of Booming. Bunch of boomers? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bunch of old <laughs> men complaining about millennials. <laughs> Those gosh darn millennials. Ruining everything. Damn. They're the ones spreading all the COVID, huh? That's right. Them damn <laughs> kids. Those whippersnappers, if they just stay home, wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's funny. I could I could totally be an old person. Like well, I, mean, I, I got I mean I mean I am, but <laughs> uh like I could totally I could probably pass as a boomer sometimes. <laughs> I think, like, just the way that society is, it's so easy to, to like, be old, to have, like, an old mindset. Mm-hmm. Because technology advances so quick that you're mm-hmm. out of the loop so much faster, I feel like, than you were back in the day. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like being an old person is so easy. Oh, yeah, absolutely is. I I have them moments all the time. Anytime a new, like, uh, app or, like, social media type thing comes out or something that I should be, like, on top of because of the entertainment stuff, and I'm just like, oh, another thing to try to learn? I'm too old for this. <laughs> I, I don't I even know get I'm it. I old because I, I have to tell my kids that I used to be able to dance. <laughs> which is a very old person thing to say. I'm so, I'm so fragile that I can't even dance anymore. <laughs> That's pretty old. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh man. So, are you going to do comedy ever again? I know like you you kind of you took the hiatus and then obviously yeah. now we're now we're in an uh another hiatus, uh a yeah. forced hiatus everybody <laughs> is. <laughs> For the most so, part. So, I mean, I've, I've started to write again, at least. Oh, right on. Um, and with the, the show that Alex and I do, uh, at the end of each episode, we have a segment called Test That Premise. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, like, forces me to work that muscle one, at least once a week. Mm-hmm. So, oh, no, that's good. It, I'm not super focused on it just because, like you said, the state of everything. L.A. just shut down again, I heard. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, normal comedy shows, it seems like we're far from some. It, it's not, like, super important to me right now as much as the podcast is. Yeah. Well, and this is a good time to be focusing on other things like podcasts. I know I put in a lot more uh, effort into my podcast since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, 
just because, yeah, I don't, you know, and who knows with stand up, like it, I'm seeing touring comics that, that, that have made a living doing comedy professionally looking for jobs, you know, like, oh, yeah, and they're like, yeah, this probably isn't going to be, uh, you know, uh, probably not going to be able to make an income from this for a couple of years to get back to where they were before. And it's just crazy. Think about even if you were a, a writer for a show, like all of that writing work is kind of going out of the window because productions are having to shut down. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking about that last night, like these new shows that are coming out on Netflix. It's like, if they do well, they, does it even matter? Cause like, are they going to be able to do the same production that they were doing before? Like, it's all. Oh this- yeah. Yeah, very that, wild stuff. It is, and then I see like you see, and maybe they've already because they you know they could have did some of the filming already, but I've seen like uh, new shows that were announced for the fall and stuff, and it's like how are they going to film these? You know, like what what happens? You know, like even yeah. even se- even shows that have been renewed for another season or whatever, it's like have they even you know. Were they already filming these and got a bunch to get started, or is that going to mess up the whole scheduling for the fall? And fall's always been for TV; it's always the huge time, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You should get a, a cameo. I thought about it, but I'm not famous. I mean, yeah, but you could nobody... pretend to be. You could just say that you're the third Sklar brother. Yeah, I could do that, or I could shave and say I'm a I'm Jason Alexander. Uh, I could I could squander my way into that, I suppose. <laughs> I Who still don't that, feel uh, like it would pay. <laughs> Who is that guy from uh, from Tool Time? Oh uh, no, 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 Al Bundy. No, that's oh, for, he was from no. Children. Uh, his name You're was right. Al, though. You're right. Yes, it was Al, but not Bundy. Uh, <laughs> I forget his. I forget what his last name was, but yeah, Al yeah. Flannel, I think. Yeah, there you go. I could probably. Uh, I mean, I am pretty handy. I can build some stuff. I do I a lot can. of that. Kind of, I do a lot of that kind of stuff, the building and whatnot. But whatever. Oh. <laughs> I'm just trying to mon- monetize the podcast. If that's you know, get this, yeah. get them numbers, and you know, I just actually I just did. Uh, I had a Facebook group that I created and I was an admin in when I was in San Diego. And over the years, I've changed it. The name, it started out as the, you know, San Diego Comedy Connection. And then it went to the, when I moved back to the Midwest, I just changed it to the Comedy Connection. And then a friend of mine who was also one of the admins thought it'd be funny to change the name to the official Dan Bublitz Sucks group and whatever, <laughs> but. The problem with all that is, is that you can't you can't change the name of a Facebook group is whenever you want. You have to wait a month before you can change it again. And he didn't know that. He thought it was going to be a funny little joke, and then he was like, "Oh shit! I didn't realize you couldn't change any of this back." And so I was like, "Yeah." So I just archived the group. So because I didn't want you know people being all confused or whatever. But then I decided, you know what? I'm going to make that, I'm going to change the group over and make it so it's dedicated to the podcast. So now it is the official Art of Bombing podcast group. <laughs> now nice. I just wait, wait to see all the people leave the group. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is fine, because then I don't, you know, people, if they, they leave the group or whatever, if it gets too small, I can always delete the group, which is fine too. Yeah. But it has like over two thousand members in the group, so I was wow. like, "Well, we'll see if that helps." <laughs> I think you should rename it back to the Dan Bublitz Sucks Group. Oh yeah, the Why irony. Is it? Play the meta game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, not enough people in the group even know who I was, so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like I said, it was a big comedy group, so lots of people in it from all over. Uh, but whatever. Let's get into this, this art of bombing stuff. Uh, you know, you did do comedy. I'm sure you've bombed. Have you? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'll let you t- get into the story, but real quick, do you ever feel like you bombed doing a podcast? 
Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. I had somebody uh, book me, <laughs> or not book me, but have me on as a guest because they thought I was super funny. And uh, they were like talking me up to their friends, their co hosts, like big time. And I came in and was talking about like cancel culture and nothing comedy related. And you could just see how bummed out they all were that. <laughs> Wasn't oh, in there the, the funny place. <laughs> they were like, they were hoping it was going to be like morning radio. You're going to come in there being all zany and silly and just yeah, all over the place. And you're like, let's get serious. <laughs> you're canceled. <laughs> yeah. I came in there yeah. and really did the old, uh, pulled the old uh, stepdad move on him. <laughs> look like I'm going to be a lot more enjoyable than I actually am. Uh, <laughs> that happens. That happens. <laughs> I've had a couple of people on this podcast, and I won't say names, that I felt a little kind of kind of bombed it. Kind of bombed it. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, but yeah. let's get into the comedy part. Let's hear your story about it, the time you felt like you bombed the worst. Time that I bombed the worst? Um was probably and i think just because like over the overall experience was very bad <laughs> so uh i started producing shows uh last year and i had like a couple of like pretty good shows but the management was so bad mm -hmm. like they wouldn't put up flyers in the entryway like it was just it's a lot of missing parts and that's and then, sometimes that's really tough as a producer because if you, the venue isn't helping to support, you know, what you're doing, it's so hard to win. Oh, yeah. And so I, I showed up and the owner had left town and then the co-owner had something that came up. So it was just myself and uh, the, um, the bartender and that was it. So there was nobody there to write checks. There was nobody there to like move the chairs and tables to where they needed to be. Cause I was still doing a nine to five while producing these shows too. So, mm -hmm. um, so already I'm like, this is, this is terrible. And I had booked uh, Jason Schomer and uh, Jody Maruska who are two phenomenal human beings. And so before they even showed up, I was already like freaking out. And then they show up and I'm like, just apologizing for everything left and right. So it's like super unprofessional out of the gate. Um, and then I hit the stage finally and the audience is like at least half of what I, <laughs> probably less than half of what I said was going to be there. We, we were supposed to have like 160, I think like 40 people showed up. Oh. And uh, so I get on, on, on stage. Oh, and the audience <laughs> decided on their own to move the tables around to where they wanted them to be. So oh. one, one group had pulled these tables over and had made their own little, so like, half of the the table was closed off to the stage they weren't even looking at us <laughs> so, <laughs> so did they have like their backs to the stage yeah okay <laughs> um and then i got up on stage and just ate a big old bag of dicks oh i could tell some of the audience had heard my material before which is never good and and then there's this this big guy that started twisting an empty water bottle during my set. Oh. So you could hear that crinkling. It was so bad. I, I got no applause after my set. Jody goes on, does amazing. Shomer goes on. Or no, actually, we had to stop. We had to do an intermission after Jody's set because we didn't have a server to bring anybody beers. So everybody got up, went, got beers and a bunch of random stuff, came back, had to try and reset the crowd with more jokes that they didn't want to hear from me. And uh, 
and then Shomer finally gets on, and that guy with the the water bottle mm -hmm. started doing it again. And Shomer isn't like a dirty comic; he doesn't swear on stage. And he got super pissed, and was like, "Who, who the hell is twisting that? Give me that!" He went down into the audience, grabbed the water bottle from the guy, and then threw it on the ground, and then finished his set. <laughs> but like, no, so I was a absolute wreck the whole time. Super unprofessional. Like, j j I, I kept saying like. This this isn't how it was supposed to be. You know, I had big goals, and uh, Jason was like, "Look, if you can't handle a night like this, you're never gonna make it. You have no chance at all." He's absolutely like, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, it just kept making me feel worse and worse and worse. And then after that, like, that was kind of the decline out of comedy too. Was like. I was like, okay, I could have just been normal and been like, ah, you know what? Shit happens. Not my fault. I did the best that I could on stage and chalked it up to just one night of bombing. But it turned into like a spiral of like, I'm not good enough for anything. And I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> Oh, I've definitely been there. And I think that that actually adds to it, though, when you're producing, too. Like, I've found... Yeah where there's plenty of times when I'm producing the show, even as, as the host, I don't do very well. And it's not so much that I couldn't have done as well, but I'm thinking about a million other things. So I'm not like, I'm not putting all my energy into just being a comedian and being the host, you know, cause like, you know, as a producer, you're thinking about all these things and you have all these things that are already going wrong, you know, oh, yeah. with, you know, there's nothing worse than like, Oh God, how am I going to be able to pay the comedians? Or, you know, when, when you're working with another venue that's supposed yeah. to write the checks and stuff like that, like, because, you know, it really shows, you know, if a comedian shows up and you got to try to, well, I can, can I get you tomorrow or what, you know, like <laughs> it just makes you look, like a terrible producer, even though like sometimes it's out of your control, you know, especially in situations like that. But. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I mean, overall, like the, the crowd loved Jason and Jody, but they just were not, not into me. And then I, it's like that whole, as soon as you appear unconfident, the crowd is not into it. Like there's, there's the version of like timid, when you're on stage mm -hmm. to like go into kind of a persona and like, that's going to be how your set goes. Kind of like, uh, like comrade trip. Have you seen him? Yeah. I've seen him a couple times. So like where his voice is quieter and like you have to be more attentive and he seems kind of fragile. There's that where it's your stage presence versus like losing it. And the crowd knows that you actually don't have control over over what's going on and mm -hmm. they know that you're not gonna you so what once they pick up on that then they they it's almost like when you see a comic that you don't like and you already have that in your head that you're like i'm yep. not gonna laugh at anything this guy says they they kind of start to it's not that they don't want to like you they paid money because they want to <laughs> they want to like yep you. But no, absolutely. They, they sense that lack of confidence and they just start to, ah, I don't even, it's not worth paying attention to then. Yep. It's, uh, you know, as soon as they smell the fear, they're, they'll they eat you alive. That's essentially it. Because, and a lot of times, I you know, I've noticed over the years is that audiences feed off your energy and they, you know, they can tell your energy. They can tell when somebody's confident and, you know, confidence is something that uh, when people have confidence pe you know other people are attracted to them and it's the same when people don't have confidence they're unattracted to them you know mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what kind of how I've always seen it is like oh as soon as they can smell the fear they'll just eat you alive you know yeah and that I, definitely do you do doesn't much crowd work I do not because I'm not good at crowd work I mean <laughs> I'll admit it. That's one of my weakest points. I mean, sometimes I'll do some crowd work and it goes really good. But a lot of times if I do crowd work, I'm forced to do crowd work. Oh, that, you know what I mean? Like, I don't go out of my way to do crowd work. 
I mean, I might interact with somebody in the audience, but it's very minimal. But like, yeah. there was one show that I did. Uh, it was like a year ago. It was a house show at the in Sioux City, and by the time I got up, the crowd was. You know, they could bring their own alcohol and stuff, and it was kind of a longer show. So by the time I got up, and other comics kind of had them riled up, so, like, the audience was really wanting to be part of the show, and there was a lot of heckling and things like that. And I did over an hour, and of that hour, I probably did 15 minutes of my material, and the rest was crowd work. It went fine. It was fun. (laughs) But it was one of them situations where... I was, it was forced on me. I wasn't, yep. I didn't go in there with the expectation to do crowd work. I went in there to do my jokes and I just knew my, it wasn't going to work. You know, yeah. it wasn't going to work. An, that's such an interesting beast. Like when you. I got my windows open because it's really oh. hot up here. <laughs> oh, we'll cut funny. that out. <laughs> Um, but when, when you're going on later and you can already hear the heckling and you know that you're going to have to address it and like that, that like for me, it's hard because I consider like other comics, my friends. And so I take it as like a personal thing. like, Oh, you're, you're going after my friends. Now I'm going to have to address you when I get on stage. So how do I, how do I put you in your place without seeming like a total dick? and then not let the rest of my set be brought down because I had to address the thing that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely those situations. I mean, it's really about kind of gauging the the audience and the heckling and stuff, you know, like, is it one person being a jerk the whole night? Something like that. If you go up later, yeah, you'll maybe address it because you're getting irritated. And the situation, you know, that I was talking about, it wasn't just one person. It was the audience. They were riled up. It was coming from you. everywhere. In fact, my friend that that kind of helped me book the gig or whatever, he ended up not being able to come because he had a family thing. But he originally booked me to do my one man show there, and. Oh. Just reading the audience, I went up and I was like, yeah, I got booked to do this one man show. I know that's what was advertised, but uh, I got to be honest. I don't think you guys would be into it. It's really sad and you guys are ready to party. So let's not. And then I went into doing material and then it ended up going into doing crowd work. You know, so like it was totally thrown off, like everything that I was, you know, planning. And And at that time, I hadn't even did my one person show in a long time. I don't know why my friend wanted me to do it there because I hadn't done it. And I was actually just doing like a little tour and I was just trying to find, a, you know, stops along the way. And so it was like all these different things. And then, like I said, I ended up not doing the one man show and just and then ended up not even doing my own material. For the most part, I ended up doing crowd work. <laughs> but. um. I can definitely see, though, like I've seen situations and I've seen it on other comics, too, where you'll have somebody in the audience. It's one person. They're heckling everybody, just totally being a jerk. And it's like every comic goes up there and tries to shut that person down just because they're irritated at what they're doing to the rest of the show. Um, But it's definitely, like I said, you definitely have to... uh, find balance because you can easily by being a jerk to a heckler easily lose the rest of the audience at that show that i did with with uh you and sean i remember um it was a clean show and i had planned on doing a joke that was that was dirty and sean was like yeah just go for it and i did the uh this joke where i uh talk about how how i think that jesus went from village to village crop dusting the villagers Mm-hmm. And uh, and the crowd didn't respond well to that. And so I finished the joke. And then I, I, you <laughs> even commented afterward, I just stared out into the crowd for a second. <laughs> and uh, and because I was like, I, I should stop. But I didn't realize how much time had gone. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, well, I guess we'll just uh, go to... Uh, our, our next comic. 
But yeah, well, that was commenting uh, afterwards. You were like, we kind of lost you there for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the <laughs> joke that, where Sean was like, oh, maybe don't do that next time? <laughs> oh, no. The, or something? Uh, no, because afterwards I told him the joke. Because at first I was like, let me run the joke by you. It's the, oh, okay. the asthma blowjob joke. And uh, he was like, nah, don't don't worry about it. I'm sure it'll be fine. And that was when I w- like was contemplating doing it, but the Jesus farting joke was too much for people because there was like an audible gasp when, when oh, okay. that Jesus had farted uh, at the, the young child. And I was like, well, they're definitely not going to like blowjobs then, so I'm going to stay away from that. And uh, But then after the show, yeah, I told Sean what I was going to say. And that's when he was like, definitely, definitely never do that. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> that's funny. That sounds like Sean. Yeah, definitely <laughs> never do that. <laughs> that's great. But you were, you ended up, well, I can't remember. That was a whole weekend though. So you like, yeah. cause didn't you host, host all the shows? Yeah. Or at least, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, cause you still had, you had some good sets in there. I, I don't think. Maybe that one particular show, it didn't go. That that particular your your, your dismount wasn't very good that night. <laughs> but the rest of the, I mean, I thought the rest of the weekend you did really well. I thought. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about that that Jesus farting joke. So, I tell like part of the punchline, which is it's basically like a pull my finger joke. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the crowd heard me do that, that Jesus was like, "But do you smell anything?" I heard them go, <gasps> but then when I stood up and his disciples said, Jesus Christ, they all laughed at that, but then went back to gasping afterwards. Yeah. So yeah. it was like, you guys don't want to laugh, but yeah. you know it's a good joke. <laughs> yeah. And that happens a lot. I think because a lot of people are really, uh, especially when it comes to religious type jokes, even though it's not a religious joke. But anytime you're doing, you know, jokes about religion or Jesus mm-hmm. or anything like that, or even any God, really, yeah. uh, people get really tight about it because it's like, I don't know if I should laugh at that. You know, <laughs> it, it's a weird thing. It really it's is. A, it's a and great then, feeling when you can trick them into laughing, though. Oh, absolutely. Like, and there's times when you can do a joke, a religious joke, and people will just love it. You know, it's yeah. it's a weird yeah, there's a, there's all kinds of ways because I, I mean, like especially in Minnesota or, or I, I would say Midwest in general, like Lutheran Catholic jokes, mm-hmm. crowds absolutely love that. Like across yep. the board, yeah, and I think uh, that that goes to uh, I think that's attributed to relatability. You know, a lot oh, yeah. of people in the Midwest are that you're raised Catholic or Lutheran. You know, so a lot of people can relate to that kind of stuff. You know, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> even uh, Sean at that show, he had a new that bit that he does about you know drive through church that did pretty good. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yep, exactly. So if you do it in the right way, there is it's a tricky thing. Like I'm trying to remember who told this to uh, Jerry Seinfeld. There was this this comic that was talking to Jerry, and uh, he was talking about the first time that he had heard a cancer joke. And how shocking that was because you weren't supposed to talk about like um, terminal illnesses. Mm-hmm. It was very, it would bring the room down and it was not good for them, all these things. And uh, this, this comic told it so well that afterwards somebody went up to him and was like, we don't tell cancer jokes unless they're that funny. <laughs> and so it's like there's all these things that you have to be so good at it and have it dialed in so perfectly for there's because really there's any topic you could hit oh absolutely and, that's why i feel like you know because there's a lot of like taboo subjects and or premises and there's trigger words and things like that and there's you know the whole debate about freedom of speech and this and that blah 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 <laughs> I honestly think you can joke about just about anything and it's all on how you present it. You know, if you make yeah. a, if you're really clever, you, you, there's some jokes that you can do, you know, a very funny and talented writer can get away with that somebody less talented 
could you know wouldn't be able to get away with you know like we could have this you and i could do the same exact joke and it'd be kind of a shock joke and it could be you know your version is way better than my version you know where your your version just everybody laughs i do a similar version but it's not quite it's more shock it's it's more shocking than clever i guess that's the difference yeah. You know what I mean? Like there are jokes that are very uh, that can be very offensive, but they're very clever versus yeah. just plain out trying to get, you know, a laugh or shock humor. Yeah, I think like there's I think there's a <clears throat> lovable version of a piece of shit. And I think oh, absolutely. that's kind of the way that I do it on stage is that you like I look kind of greasy. I'm not the most well cut individual. So like I've, I've already got that kind of look about me and then the way that I say things it's kind of like how jim norton like a vulgar human being but somehow still super lovable at the same time Mm -hmm. well and that's the same for you know like uh anthony jesselink is a good example of this he's very i mean his jokes are very clever and very well written and but they're they can be very very offensive but i think (laughs) part of what how he gets away with it isn't just because they're so, you know, cleverly written, but it's also because look at him. He looks yeah. like a nice guy. You know what I mean? Like he's very clean cut and he usually yeah. dresses nice and things like that. So that kind of attributes to, you know, his your your persona and 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 that kind of thing, which I think helps can help sell a joke and make it so it's yeah. like, oh, he's definitely joking. Look at this guy. He looks too nice to be that mean. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that kind of thing. I've I've always said that Jesselnick is like the the best embodiment of the devil you love to hate. Because mm-hmm. like the things that he, if you were to hear those jokes from just a friend, you would be like, you're not allowed to speak anymore. But because <laughs> of the way that he looks and how sinister he sounds when he hits it, it's like it's that character, and he like does such a good job at being that character on stage that mm-hmm. you just love it. You're like, yeah, it's horrible, but I love it. Yeah. I shouldn't be laughing at this, but <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, that that body in the woods joke is still one of my favorite jokes of all time. Yeah. You know what I'm talking I'm about? Not, I'm not sure if I've heard that one. I mean, I've seen some of his stuff and I, I'm aware of him, but I haven't like, I haven't deep delved into all his mm-hmm. stuff. He's not my, he's not really my kind of comic, but oh. yeah, well, I mean, and is it because of the, like, cause I, I have noticed that there's comics who are trying to win back the audience by, by proving that they can say whatever they want. And that feels super forced. Like, do you think it's in that way that you're like, are you are you doing these things because you think you're able to write well written jokes about these topics, or are you just you just know that you can write about anything, and so you're just doing these really? Oh no, I just I'm not a lot of his kind of humor just isn't my cup of tea. It has nothing to do with how he presents it or what his his thinking behind it is. It has nothing to do with like ego or anything like that. I just one thing I've noticed over the year, like I've I'm not big on offensive comedy, even if it's sure. cleverly written. I mean, if it's super offensive, and I can as a as a comedian myself, I can appreciate why other people are laughing at a joke and why they think it's funny and that kind of thing, but still not be for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, It's the same with, you know, a lot of people love roasts and Uh that kind of stuff. I'm not a big roast guy. And maybe it's because I'm, I'm a nice guy and I don't, you know, I, I don't like being mean to people, you know, that could be part of it, but that's, you know, something I've never, you know, I've seen some roasts and watched some roasts that were, uh, absolutely amazing and some of the jokes were just you know just super hilarious but overall not my cup of tea you sure. know, um, i i look at roasts <clears throat> in the sense that like they're brand new jokes and i love like brand new so for me like whenever i so for and i'm a self-deprecating type of comedy mm-hmm. so like when so i've never been offended by anything when it comes to those roasts because i'm like 
I, I sift through it and I go, that's so well written because of, I'm such a geek for comedy that like I see past what's supposed to be, you know, like a jab or mm-hmm. whatever. And I just go, oh, man, that was so good. Like Matt Field, uh, Andy Matt Field had one of my favorite roasts about me, which was um, I look like a, a gap model. The gap between um, happy and employed and dead on the street. <laughs> So. That's a good one. <laughs> Here's the thing. A lot. I mean, there's quite a few roast jokes that aren't original. They 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 have a formula where it's blah, blah, oh, blah, yeah. where they insert name, do the line, insert thing. You know what I mean? So it's like you just change a couple words and it's the same same yeah. roast joke, but about different a different person. Yeah. And I've seen that, too. So it's not like every roast joke is that original. I mean, yeah, there are Jeff some. Ross is kind of like that. Yeah, and and there are some original. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of original roast jokes, but there's still quite a few that aren't that original. But sure. I, I don't know. For me, it's just, uh, and I think also it's the kind of style of comedy too. You know, like I, yeah. I'm more of a, I like more of a storytelling type. You know, comic. Like I, you know, love comedy from like Mike Berbigula. I love. Oh, sure. uh, Tom, I love Tom Segura's storytelling abilities and thing, you know, like just that's kind of what I like. So when you're you on know. stage, it feels <clears throat> like um, you have a very like backyard bonfire vibe to you <laughs> in that people may not know what's going on if they were to walk in late, but you just it just feels good to be there. Mm hmm. Oh, thank you. I don't. I don't know. I'm like, is that a compliment or an insult? Are you calling me a hippie? Did you just call me a hippie? Y'all don't oh, got man. no goddamn hippie here. No, because <laughs> your your grass is cut to an inch and a half exactly. Because that's the perfect walking size. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. No, it's I've never, I've never yard. been, never been uh, described like that. But hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> As long as you don't walk in late, you'll know what's going on. <laughs> You're late. You're screwed. You're going to be like, who is this guy? How did he get on stage? Somebody get the hook and yank him off. <laughs> That's what you should name your next album is Don't Walk In Late. <laughs> don't Walk In Late. <laughs> don't Walk In Late. Boom. There you go. Start from the beginning. <laughs> Every time somebody walks in. (laughs) That might be, uh, no, that might be more appropriate name for an album. Start from the beginning. Oh, yeah, there you go. (laughs) A.K.A. Don't Come Late or Don't Walk In Late. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, for sure, coming late is always, you know, it's never good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. Uh, sometimes coming early is not good either. Depends on the situation. <laughs> Just depends on what the situation is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But going back to that offensive type comedy and like pushing the limits and stuff, you know, like another comic that I enjoy watching who really can. And I think it's because in that situation, he really pushes the boundary to see how far he can go before an audience is like, all right, we can't go any further with this. And that's uh, Daniel Tosh. Oh. You know, like, he'll say something terrible and get a laugh, and then he'll be like, oh, you thought that was bad. Let's see this. And then he'll say something even worse, and then he'll still get a laugh, and he's like, oh, oh, I can keep going. And then he'll do another, and then... And then when he senses that the audience is like, all right, now you've got to stop. He's like, well, that joke was great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> time to go on to the next subject. I, I didn't appreciate him enough when I was younger because I thought that he was just like an emaciated Dane Cook. And I wasn't mm-hmm. like super into him. But now looking back on like, just like you were saying, like, it's so impressive to have your entire set in your head. And then to know all of these different ways that you can get to the end and mm-hmm. be able to keep everything on track, that's that blows me away. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And watching him, like watching him perform too. Like you can just see him up there, like when he's on stage, just reading the audience too, you know, like knowing when, you know, uh, you can just tell in his head, he's like, okay, they laughed at that. I can keep going. And then when they start pushing back, he knows that it's time to let up yeah. or totally just go all in. <laughs> you know, And I've seen him do that too, where he's like, you know what? Yeah, yeah. We're already here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love that. I, man, I geek out over comedy so much. My wife hates watching stand-up specials with me because I'll pause it and be like, do you know why that's funny? Okay, so the first... <laughs> and the misdirection that came... Yeah, just... that's funny. You're like analyzing it all? Yeah. I have a hard time actually watching stand-up. <laughs> Even, I mean, I've seen so much comedy, and spe- like live comedy too, that it's like... Unless it's really good, it's hard to watch just because it seems like it just seems like all comedy is becoming the same comedy. Yeah. Kind of, if that makes sense. So I have a real hard time watching stand up. Do you you remember going to, to shows and thinking like in the back of your head for whatever reason, like if if they need a comic to go and do a tight five. In case of an emergency, I'm ready. Uh, not really. No, because I didn't go to a lot yeah. of when I first started. I didn't go to a lot of stand up show shows. Oh, okay. I mean, I go hang out at open mics and stuff like that. Uh, but I wasn't actually going to shows. I mean, I would go once in a while, but not. You know, there's like people that you know, especially open. You know, when you're an open micer, that. Mm-hmm. During the week, you're hitting open mics. On the weekends, there's not a lot of open mics, so those comics will go hang out at the, the the comedy club, the local comedy club, which is great. It's a smart thing to do. I mean, because you you get to see professionals doing their thing, and you can learn a lot from that. Might even get to meet them. Then you start networking a little bit. So there's great you know benefits of going and hanging out on a comedy club on the weekend. Um, but I never did starting out, not a lot, just because I was, you know, busy with life, you know, still had a job, you know, relationship, all these other responsibilities. So I couldn't just go hang out all the time and do comedy. I had to try to balance it the best I could. Sure. I don't know if anybody's thrown this your way or not, but have you ever thought about being a manager? Um, I've thought about it. I mean... I've talked to another comic a little bit about it. Um, it's just, you, it's you like have such a good way of making like, like you've helped me out with stuff a bunch and thank you by the way. Uh, um, yeah. But you have such a way of making things seem like way less scary and more manageable than they actually may even be. Like a lot of the stuff that I've taken on, like, I, I mean, I get like four hours of sleep a night. So it's insane. But the, I don't, just the way that you have told me certain steps, like how to move forward with things. Mm-hmm. To me, when I say those things, I'm like, oh, that's never going to happen. And you have this very like, <laughs> no, you just do A, B, C, and then things will start to happen. Like you just have to make sure you do it in order. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely, I mean, because I've even thought about, and I have done some teaching, too. Like, I have did some classes and stuff on yeah. certain things. So, yeah, I did, uh, I had a, a workshop that I did for uh, how to, you know, for emceeing. And I've, you know, I've even written, like, some public speaking presentations and things like that, you know. Uh, I did a little bit of stuff, you know, talked on <clears throat> panels and stuff like that, too. So, I mean, like I said, I have thought about it, but then it's like, oh, well, how bad do I want to do comedy? And now, even now, like, what would be the point of being a manager? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. nobody's oh, yeah, doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, but this, who like... knows, like, in the future. But, I mean, like, I think in my situation now, if I could be – I'm not necessarily a manager, but a producer, you know, mm-hmm. and that's something I've been trying to – to get into and i you know i've seen a couple people that were starting podcasts and things like that or they were thinking about it and i was like hey if you're interested 
you know, I'd be interested in being a producer. I have a studio, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And they just weren't, I don't know if they just weren't real serious about doing the podcast yeah. or not, or if they did, but everybody just kind of blew me off in that respect. Yeah. And it's like, all right, well, whatever, teach their own. I'm just going to work harder on mine. <laughs> well, and I mean, yeah, I, I've had quite a few people like in the same thing. Did be, it sucks being good at what you do because then people come and ask you to, to help them out with things or they ask you about buying gear, like especially mm-hmm. for podcasting, like that happens all the time. But yeah, there's so many people with ideas and then like their, their idea really only goes two shows. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, what, absolutely. What do you want to do after that? And then, so when you try to have that conversation, they're like, well, there's too many podcasts anyways. Yeah. Yep. And the other thing too, like, you know, and, and I don't think people give, uh, P, you know, unless you have a, a, a huge following or something, I don't think people give independent podcasters enough credit either. You know what I mean? Like it, in our situation, we're both, we're both very motivated, especially when it comes to our podcast, mm-hmm. you know, producing, recording, we take it serious. We keep upgrading our equipment. Yeah. You know, we've had, plenty of conversations about marketing and this and that and things like that. And other people don't, you know, they're just like, I want to do this podcast because it's Mm -hmm. the thing to do. And they don't think about all the issues that they're going to have. And then when you, you know, like I said, I've approached people and they just kind of blew me off and I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to press it, but I want to be a lot of times I'm going to be like, well, are you ready for this, 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 and this? And, you know, these are all things that I've already worked through. You know what I mean? Like I've already, (laughs) I started this podcast with a phone, (laughs) you know, like recording on a phone. And now, you know, now we're doing it remotely with fancy computer and fancy (laughs) mics. And I got a fan, you know, studio and this and that or whatever. So it's like I've already worked through all the shit and I could save you tons of time. You know, also already have all the equipment. (laughs) (laughs) And that's That's the thing that I told people, too. Yeah, well, because that's something that a lot of people don't realize. If you want to put out a decent quality podcast, you have to make a decent investment up front. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, and I didn't think about that. I was just like, yeah, I got the Internet and a computer (laughs) and some editing software and a phone. I got this, you know, and I went at it. And then I quickly realized, oh, this is a terrible podcast. Like, (laughs) <laughs> the idea was good, the content was good, but the quality was terrible, you know, yeah. and people, like, that was some of the feedback I got right away, too, was like, hey, your quality is not good, it's hard to listen to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's great content, but it's hard to listen to, you need to work on that, and were they were right, like, I wasn't offended. Like Brian Redband with the, uh, with the levels there, peaking all the time? Uh, well, I mean, what levels? I was using my phone. <laughs> you know, there, there was no control on anything. <laughs> like, I don't know how far, if you've, you know, listened to this, my podcast much at all, if you have, or yeah. how far you went back. But if you listen to the very first episode, the very first episode, you can tell the difference between where I started and where I am now. Like, if you listen to the first episode and the last episode that I put out, you can see the difference. And that first episode was on my phone, interview style, on a table, outside a bar, after an open mic, keyword <laughs> outside, on a patio, after an open mic. There's freaking motorcycles driving by. It's nighttime. There's people coming out and talking. And then it's me and the, you know, the comic trying to have this conversation or whatever. But it was terrible audio. <laughs> Dude, that's that's my wife and I. When we started, we would pass the phone back and forth, or I had <clears throat> I had this box that I would put the phone on, mm-hmm. and it would be kind of in between us. And uh, we, when we started having, <laughs> so stupid that we had guests on when we were just recording with the phone. But um, I would let them know at the top that if you need to fart, just grab the phone and fart into the phone. <laughs> Because that's the type of content that I wanted was to have farts. <laughs> audible farts all the audible time. Audible farts. 
And yeah, it was all phone, man. I mean, there's like, there were things that you could kind of do, but it still sounded like a phone. So I, I, oh, like I yeah, absolutely. To tell people about, because we had <laughs> everything was up being uploaded to SoundCloud, mm-hmm. which was another mistake. It should have right out of the gate started with Apple, but I, I, I don't even tell people about the SoundCloud thing anymore because it's like embarrassing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I keep mine out because I've had the same RSS feed since I started this podcast. So oh. I've been using the same company and everything since I started. So You've it's, been a, five, was it five years? Yeah, uh, three. Three years. Three. Just did three years. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I've had the same. So I haven't changed much at all. So that was the one thing I did invest in right away was paying to have the service Mm -hmm. versus a lot of people when they start they look for you know a a platform where it's free or whatever but then you end up with all these limitations where people were running Mm -hmm. into you know people i knew that had podcasts on a lot of those free platforms were running into oh well if i don't pay for it then i lose all these podcasts because you can only have so many out at a time. And yeah. so then there's that constant hassle of trying to rotate and archive and all that other stuff. And I was like, ah, I don't want to worry about that. If I can pay money and just leave them all up there, we're good. Yeah. And that's what I did. So, yeah, I mean, we still pay for, I think it's like 10 bucks a month uh, just to keep the episodes from, cause I've switched computers from when we started too. So mm-hmm. everything if, if I stop paying that to SoundCloud, then we lose all those episodes. I should just yep. fucking download them and get it over with. But should yep, if you can. Yeah, I actually yeah, all my episodes I I keep on a external hard drive as well. So I think I have them all. But either way, they're all out there on my feed because I don't archive. I just pay to keep it out there, whatever. Um, but how many episodes are out now? Uh, 147 regular episodes, plus there are some, like, bonus episodes, like, uh, I I was doing the Between Bombs, and then there's been a couple, uh, special presentations on the feed as well. You know, I've, I have published a couple other things on that same feed, but, um, but yeah, there's over, uh, there's probably over 150 actual downloadable podcast, you know, 147. <laughs> well, there's 147 just of the art of bombing. That does not include the between bombs and some of the bonus content. Cause I, I kind of started doing another podcast that was like, uh, I was going to try to make it a Patreon, but I released a couple episodes mm. on the feed to give an idea of what it was going to be like and that kind of thing. So I like yeah. the way you pronounce Patreon. Oh, isn't that how it's pronounced? Am I... Well, Patreon. You're putting a lot Patreon. of emphasis on the I am. syllable. <laughs> Patreon. Need to be like, on uh, there. <laughs> when, I, when I moved to Minnesota, uh, I started to notice um, people like saying um, button rather than mm-hmm. button. Yep, like really, really uh, emphasizing the T's. <laughs> or subline. But- Un. <laughs> Rather than Button. sublime, people like I was, you know, I was a ska kid, so I was like really into sublime, and I was like, "You did sure listen to sublime?" And then somebody was like, "Oh, I love sublime." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. You actually think you, you consider sublime ska? I mean, ska ish. Skyish, yeah. I was gonna say I always felt like they were more like a reggae, yeah, kind of feel. But, but the, I could the, see that a ska reggae kind of hybrid. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was gonna say. It was like you couldn't really. I'm. I don't really know what to call. I mean, there was punk elements, but like because of the more upbeat kind of thing, mm-hmm. like whatever three eleven is, that's kind of what Sublime was. Do you ever listen to three eleven? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Absolutely! Yeah, <laughs> it was one of my favorite bands growing up. Oh really? Uh, yeah! Yeah! Oh yeah! Uh, I was I was down. <laughs> <laughs> Can, do you ever go to that music festival in South Dakota? Uh, in South Dakota, 
and uh what's it uh the sewer Sioux, the sewer city sioux city something there's oh there that's in in iowa probably oh sioux that's city's right. in iowa but you're right um I had yeah, up. I don't know. I mean, the only real big, <laughs> yeah, you, I, uh, the only big festival that I went to uh, a couple in San Diego, and then I went to Warp Tour here last couple of years. But what? yeah, you you brought your kids to Warp Tour? Yeah, that's right. I did. I wish I would have had kids. <laughs> they had a they had a VIP tent for the parents. Oh you know? yeah, I was like, yeah, God, man. you could have hung out with the the in a lounge. It was hot out to, there. <laughs> I used to interview bands. On uh, on work tour, so very familiar with the parents' tent. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, it was great. Oh <laughs> no, actually, the, I went to the last one that they did their last tour, and that's because because uh, I too am a big fan of ska and real big fish and yeah. Uh, um, uh, oh god damn it! What was the other band? Is it um, Soup? No, another punkish band. Uh, um, no, 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 no. They're, uh, oh my God, I can't believe that I can't remember that. No, they're not. I know who the Flight of the Concords are. They're a comedy band, damn it. Was it Pennywise? Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, you're not. Were, they were it's, the last um, set. God damn. <laughs> I can't believe I can't remember the other band. That's that's me getting old. That's uh, me getting old. Can you can you hum uh, their tunes? Uh, I want to say, was it Operation Ivy? Oh, I'm trying to think. That would make sense. Yeah, I think it was Operation Ivy. Was it? Was the song? Well, they have all kinds. They had all kinds. Well, either way, uh, Take On Me is one that Real Big Fish did, the cover of. Oh, did they? <laughs> yeah, they? Yeah, they did. Pretty sure oh, they did. Hilarious. Uh Anyway, either way, I both of those bands, I, I got to meet both of the bands while I was there, and they signed my joke oh. book, so that was awesome. Really? Yes. Yep. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I had them sign the joke book, so that was cool. Uh <laughs> All right, well we've got derailed. It's okay. We have about we have about, you know, three or four minutes in the middle that has to get cut. <laughs> now that we've derailed and we started talking about music, you know, and we're in our oh, music for old people. <laughs> we're we're uh dating ourselves here. True. Uh yeah, there we go. But I'm gonna get back into this. I got a few standard things I like to talk about at the end. Oh, okay. The bumming of bombing, how long does that dreadful feeling last for you? Oh, my God. Um, I think it was like a a week, probably. At least a week. I mean, of, of like waking up every morning and remembering how bad I did. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like, for that, that last one, um, like, really was kind of the descent. So it carried for months probably <laughs> was that a show recently then like right that before a, everything it was a thanksgiving show oh okay so, so not oh that would have been yeah so it would have been oh i guess like it is huh? a couple of months before my like like the alcoholism like really re like really took hold mm -hmm. and so yeah it was it was not a not a good thing to happen at that time <laughs> Yeah, so it's not. Uh, yeah, well, I'm just thinking because I, I'm like, I'm totally empathetic just because like I know what it's like when you're producing, and it yeah. is so rough. It's like so demoralizing when you when yeah. you're trying to produce a show, and because you, you're 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 trying to you know you want it to be a good show for one, you want it to be a good show for the venue, you want it to be mm -hmm. a good show for the audience, and you want it to be a good show for the comics. You're trying to impress the comics and show that oh, yeah. you're you're professional, you know what you're doing. Same thing with the venue. You're trying to show them that you're professional, you know what you're doing. All, you know, so there's so many factors in it. And when you yeah. can't put it all together, and then there's sometimes things are out of your control, mm -hmm. and even when they're out of your control, you can't help but dwell on it. 
you know. Yeah. And then that doesn't help make the show go better. So I totally relate. That was me having a having a uh, a moment where I was like, oh man, <laughs> having it's, a... it's beyond bombing and and it's it's failure because it's one thing. Yeah, like no, it really that. is. Yeah. yeah. You're right. It it's it's more it turns more into failure than bombing at that mm-hmm. point. But like I said, all, all you can do is get up get back up and keep doing it. I mean yeah. that's the only way. You gotta fight through it. After you bomb, how do you analyze your sets? Do you or do I you know. I should say, do you analyze your sets regardless, like whether you yeah, do good sure. or not? Yeah. I I spe- well and like there's because I, I I was running an open mic too, I kind of had free range to kind of say random shit throughout the night. Mm-hmm. And so when I would go to other mics, I would I would think that I had more time than I really did to like be loose. Oh yeah, things. yeah. So I yep. I had to yeah. So I started noticing that, and I was like, okay, I gotta I gotta get my shit together. If I'm not at my my home game, then I need to remember that i'm just like every other comic there and mm-hmm. if you want to get those chuckles you gotta keep it tight <laughs> oh yeah for sure well and that it's uh, that also goes back to being professional too because mm-hmm. when you're not running when it's not your show it you know if you just kind of do whatever you want for time or whatever you're not paying attention and you run the mm-hmm. light you end up coming off real unprofessional Oh yeah. Too. That's... Well, it wasn't that I was running lights. I just I would see the flash and go, "Oh fuck, I've only done two." Jobs. Oh, gotcha. You know gotcha. what I mean? So like, I yeah, would think yeah, that yeah. I had room to stretch and all that stuff. And, and I gotcha. Oh, okay. More taking your time doing the jokes and you know and kind of messing around versus yeah. Okay, these are the jokes I I want to do. You know, do the joke, wait for the laugh break or whatever. Do the next yeah. joke, that kind of thing. It's I gotcha. Yeah. 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 That was a big thing. Um, like when I, uh, did, I did a couple of guest sets at Sisyphus and they were, uh, four minute sets, which is a really weird time, but yeah, especially for a guest set. I like actually like had it figured out and it, it was like, I don't know what it is about that room, but like that was the first time that I started to, factor in laugh break if there's going to be a laugh break Mm -hmm. and then actually have the pacing down but like before that i was doing a lot of you know that stupid stretching yeah i want to see you stretch (laughs) especially if you're not funny right (laughs) there's nothing funny about a guy stretching unless he's old and pulls a muscle uh (laughs) <laughs> where <laughs> that was so fucking dumb <laughs> see i can admit when i do a dumb when i do a dumb bit that was a dumb bit <laughs> oh lord yeah sometimes they're my favorite <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> i've noticed i've been getting and i don't know if it's like a quarantine thing or not or what the deal is but i've been doing a lot more cheesy jokes oh, than yeah. like I wrote a and and right before it started, I wrote a bunch of really dumb, silly dad type jokes, and they're turning out to be my favorite jokes to tell. <laughs> oh, dude, they, they just be, oh, yeah. I I do um, like Alex and I just recorded, and he was talking about how he plays the drums, and I was like, well, I don't know if you know this, but I play guitar, and he was like, oh yeah, watch out, Carlos Santana, and then I was like. Watch out, Miley Cyrus, because I'm coming in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> and the disdain on his face brought ah, me so much joy. Ah, <laughs> so, do, yeah, doing those, like, painfully cheesy jokes can be so satisfying. Oh, they definitely can. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny that you brought up the wrecking ball, because I was like, how come I haven't seen a meme of, like, a wall... And, oh. and, you know, a wall that is like humanity and then a wrecking ball that says 2020. Yeah. That's like, you got to do it now. I know. I, I'm like, I haven't seen that meme. I got, I might have to do it. Throw it, up, throw it on your TikTok, man. Capitalize. Yeah. There we go. I don't know. I've been thinking about getting rid of the TikTok. Kind of 
reading some stuff about it. Down, well, not they might be getting banned in the U.S., but not shut down. I mean, they're still. I mean, they're they can't shut them down. They're not a U.S. company or whatever. But I was reading some stuff that other people had posted, not related necessarily related to the ban. But it sounds mm-hmm. like they do have a lot of like uh, like security breach type stuff like a lot of backdoor stuff that's really very scary as far as not like them attacking the nation, but just like personal stuff. They're getting sure. a lot of the data. They can get access to like um, credit card information and things that you have saved on, you know, like web browsers or whatever, that kind of yeah. stuff. They can access some of that data. So I'm could be have to yeah. my seven year old's TikTok account. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would do some reading. That's what I've been I've been doing some reading. I'm like, oh, damn, I finally found an, uh, a social media platform where I'm getting some traction. That's just my luck. <laughs> Gonna have to shut it down. Shut it down. Ain't got no views on. Ain't got no, uh, no 8,000 views or 80,000 views on no YouTube shit. You have 80,000 uh. views? On one of my videos, yeah, it's like seventy nine point one k. Whoa! Yeah, it's just it it's crazy because so I have one video that did really well, and everything else that I posted is just like mediocre, <laughs> like at best. I mean, because I'm only really posting stand up. Like I'm not doing silly TikTok stuff. I'm just doing yeah. stand up, and I've been experimenting with it. You know, different lengths, with or without subtitles, you know, that kind of stuff. But I have this one that, like I said, it's it's a super short, short joke. It's like 16 seconds, and it's got almost 80,000 views on it. And then oh, wow. I have a couple other videos. The next best video is like 1,500 views maybe, and then everything else is like 100 to 200. But, so yeah. Funny. Yeah, it's crazy trying to figure it out. And that's and I'm I'm a nerd like that because you know, I'm going to school for well, I just pretty much finished school for marketing. So like oh. you know, watching that and experimenting with different things like that, I find interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, just the, the different to see what works and what doesn't and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. But R- All right. R&D. Yeah, yep, research and development. Although I'm not developing, I'm only researching. <laughs> Still working on that 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 developing part. We'll get there though. We'll get there. <laughs> like a fine wine, we just get better with time. <laughs> uh, do you have a a pre-show ritual or a tradition? Mm. You know, uh I, I like going out and introducing myself to people that are going to be in the crowd. Like I'm a very, like, like at Nordic, I used to say that I'm the mayor of Nordic because mm-hmm. I would go introduce myself. And that's like <clears throat> with crowd work stuff, like I'm very visual. Um, so I, uh, what's the word? Superficial kind of commentary. So, like, I'll look at somebody and be like, oh, you definitely rode your snowmobile to high school. Like, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. And so, when I introduce myself before a set, and I'm, like, you know, mingling, um, when I do that stuff, they kind of feel like it's their friend up there. Mm -hmm. So, there's, like, a type of uh, clearance to do so. So, I think that's, sorry, long answer, but, yeah, that's. No, absolutely. No, that makes sense. the crowd, for sure. So you go up and you introduce yourself and you tell them you're one the one of the comics performing and all that too, or do you just I, introduce yourself? I don't always tell them that I'm performing, but I, I'll, I'll almost kind of make it seem like I work there, and so I'm just kind oh, of okay, like making sure people are comfortable and that they know what's about to happen. And so so they definitely they feel like they're definitely going to feel like you're part of what's going to happen. They just don't yeah. necessarily know what your. Uh, where you are in the the show or yeah. that yeah, kind of thing. Role is. What your role is. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Cause you're right. Cause when, cause it, it does, if people feel like you're, you're kind of uh, friends or friendly, it definitely makes it 
they, they don't they'll get less offended if you're making fun of them. Yeah, that's for sure. If they, think they, they feels... recognize who's like, or if they know who's on stage to some degree, mm-hmm. they're also you can tell they're more relaxed. They're not as tense with whatever you're saying. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, what has been your best or favorite gig that you've done so far? Um, the People of Comedy show at Sisyphus. Kadisha Cooper and Ali Sultan hosted it. And the crowd was so, like, bubbly and happy before anything even happened that by the time the comics hit the stage, nobody did bad. And it just felt like, it felt like a, like a party. Like we just, mm-hmm. and there was, God, there was like 20 comics. I think that went up on stage. Oh, insane. wow. Like an insane amount of comics that went up on stage and the crowd stayed with each comic the whole time, which was so much fun. That that's awesome. amazing. No, that's awesome. Those are like the best shows when the crowd, you can just feel the crowd is there to have a good time and they're going to have a good time the whole way through. Yeah. Oh, that just makes for a great show. Uh, the last thing I like to do, I play a game called Pick a Number. You're going to pick a number between 1 and 20. <laughs> okay. That's right. We're, we're going out cheesy. Remember, I said I'm getting cheesy <laughs> in my old age. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you a corresponding question. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want me to go now? Yeah, right now. <laughs> 19. 19. Would you win a fight? Or no, I'm sorry, not you. I read that wrong. I can't even read. And it's typed. I can't even blame it on handwriting. That was just me totally botching the question. I just bombed reading this question on this podcast about bombing. That's real life right there, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you call self-aware. Uh, who would win in a fight between Spider-Man and Batman? That is your question. I am so glad you asked because it is unequivocally Batman. Well, wait, are we saying that he has his, his, like his gear? Well, I mean, if he like what gear, like his utility belt. That yeah. Kind of, yeah. Okay. Because if, if he doesn't have that, then he's not really Batman. Is he? He's just Bruce Wayne. <laughs> he still has like the, you know, the, I mean, he can still fight, or, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I if would he doesn't say, have I, his utility belt, then Spider Man's got a spidey sense. So I think he, no, I think he has to ha- be able to use his utility belt because that's part of his his fighting. Like because if you, it wouldn't be a fair fight if he went in without any of his tools versus Spider Man who has mutant powers. Yeah, so I, you I know think what I mean? that I think Batman would win because his intellect, as far as fighting goes way su- surpasses Spider-Man. Like, it's no no contest, really. I mean, like, Spider-Man can, obviously, he's quick, but Batman, time with time again, has shown that as long as he has his resources, he can take, he can take down yeah. anybody. Also, I, and it, it's your question, obviously, that I threw <laughs> at you, but I want to add that he's also older and wiser, where you know, uh-huh. Spider Man's a lot younger and more naive. So, so are we I feel like, like Batman. High school? Well, I mean, that's kind of Spider Man's character has always been younger. You know, they've well, never, it... not to my knowledge, I've never seen a Spider Man character that was in his mid 30s to 40s and 50s and things like that. Where you, you gotta know, do a deeper dive, bro. I've been going. It's so funny that that, that I like Spider Man. So I've, I've been going balls deep on comics lately, and like there are so many different versions of Spider Man that have been I didn't know that, years. but I don't. I'm not. I don't like Spider Man. Uh, you heard oh, it you here. Don't like I, I don't like Spider Man. So oh, I see. No, no. I didn't realize no. you were racist against. Uh, you're an arachnophobic. Oh, God, I'm going to get canceled now. <laughs> oh, did you hear what Spider that damn movie said? He doesn't like spiders. He's <laughs> out of here. Somebody call Dan Aykroyd. We need an exterminator. Oh, I totally fucked that up. Oh, it was John Goodman. Oh, I lose. I lose. That's enough. I'm done. All right. So where can where can people find you? <laughs> I thought you were going with like Ghostbusters. I was like, is that? <laughs> is he an exterminator? <laughs> uh, 
but duck, duck, I mean, crazy. they were they were exterminators of ghosts. I mean, there's that. So hey, at least you you put something together. But no, I was totally <laughs> said Dan Dan Aykroyd fell out of my mouth. John Goodman was what was in my head. Botched. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah. But anyways, uh, duck, duck, gray Duke. Duke is in the college. I always feel like I'm on a phone call when I say Duke is at the college. Uh, yeah, Duck Duck Great Duke on all things social media and uh, all podcast platforms, including YouTube. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, all right. That's all you got for social media. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yeah, man, that's uh, all the things. That's all the things. I'm used to people having way more. Like, they're like, I got blah, 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 my podcast, blah, 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 my personal, blah. And you're just like, Man. gray, gray, duke, everything. <laughs> Find <laughs> us everywhere. Oh, yeah. well, short and sweet. I like it. All right. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks, man. The Art of Bombing is a Blitzed Entertainment production. Hosted and produced by Dan Bublitz Jr., the Art of Bombing intro music was written and performed by John Holt. All other music used in this podcast was under the Creative Commons license. If you would like to help the Art of Bombing, you can do so by subscribing, rating, and reviewing our show on whatever podcast application you use to listen to the Art of Bombing. For previous episodes, blogs, and more, visit artofbombingpod.com. Have a great week, and remember, stay safe so you can live to love.